Hello, welcome to Talking Shop, a podcast for trade union activists and organisers. Um, the theme of the podcast is Wages for Housework. Um, it's part of our Too Many Men series that we've been running on the blog over the last couple of months. Um, today we're joined by Rosa. Hello, um, I'm a feminist activist and a historian of um, second wave feminism, so feminism from like 1969 to 1990. And uh, the usual suspects, Dave. <laughs> I, um, I'm Dave Pike. Uh, I'm an official for the National Education Union um, and I've been a trade union organiser for about 10 years. And it's Chris. I am a secondary school teacher in Worksop and I've been organising in education around schools and nurseries and higher education as well. I just realised that I forgot to introduce myself. You um, should do that. <laughs> a rookie error. Um, so I'm Lydia. Um, I'm a rep for the London IWW branch. Um, yeah, so like I said, we're going to be talking about wages for housework. Um, Rosa is going to give us um, a kind of introduction to the history of the wages for housework movement um, and the kind of key concepts and ideas of the movement. Um, we just wanted to open with um, with the opening lines of a, of a kind of key, like a foundational essay called uh, Wages Against Housework by Silvia Federici. Um, so she opens with, they say it's love, we say it's unwaged work. They call it frigidity, we call it absenteeism. Every miscarriage is a work accident. Homosexuality and heterosexuality are both working conditions, but homosexuality is workers' control of production, not the end of work. More smiles, more money. Nothing will be so powerful in destroying the healing virtues of a smile. Neuroses, suicides, desexualization, occupational diseases of the housewife. Mm. So I think that wages for housework can be if you want to put a date on something, which is it's usually quite useful to do, I think, it's a it's a um, moment in feminism or a moment in Marxist feminism that um, probably begins around 1972 and in its kind of earliest form ends in 1977 but has resonances throughout feminist activism um i'm sure there are histories that that have got like lots of um similar demands that exist that pre-exist wages for housework mm. and i think it's very it would be very interesting for example to look more at like southern currents of political theory stuff happening in the global south that predates wages for housework in the global north always an interesting thing to do but in the in the global in the global north, wages for housework begins around in 1972, and there are groups in Italy, particularly in England and the US, in English speaking Canada, in Switzerland, and in Germany. And I think there is groups in Australia, but I that which is my area of study, but I can't be sure about that yet. But there's an archive, a wages for housework uh, archive that I'm going to look at, so that will be quite interesting. So it's the first paper that's quite influential in terms of like thinking about wages for housework is a paper called Women and the Subversion of Community, written in 1973 by Selma James and Maria Rosa Della Costa, who are two Marxist feminists um, who were working together in a collective called the International Feminist Collective. So that's just kind of the that's just a bit of context, really. That's not mm. like the, the the kind of the more interesting stuff will begin now. So, <laughs> <laughs> so um, well, can I, can I ask a question just for um, people who may be unfamiliar? When you say Marxist feminism, yeah, uh, why do you make that distinction as opposed to um, sort of feminism as, as a movement? So, so what what is distinct about like Marxist feminism? Okay, so I guess Marxist feminism centers women's role in society in labor, rather than, for example, 
other forms of feminism that may see the role of women in society as coming from somewhere different, like a kind of woolly idea of, of patriarchy or, um, well, maybe not woolly, but like very broad idea of patriarchy um, or like, for example, you know, thinking really very, very kind of seriously and, and deeply about the way that women are represented, for example, in in all different ways. So, you know, in popular culture, in art, in um, film and TV, in the way that the kind of representations of women layered on top of each other create more representations of women that are sexist. So I think, like, that's mm. one way to think about it. But Marxist feminism really centres labour as the way to think about and what women do in terms of their labour as a way to think through their role in society and the way sexism works and the way that that kind of, you know, sexism obviously always intersecting with homophobia, racism, et cetera. So does that, does that, yeah. that good? Yeah, that's really that's helpful. Clear? Yeah, that's great. Thank you. Cool. So, um, yeah, and so Wages for Housework is really, is really a part of that. So it's a, it, it looks at the role of women, particularly women, Oh, well, specifically women in the who work in the home, um, and says what does what um, does this work that women do, which is usually unpaid in the home, how does this impact on capitalism? Mm -hmm. How does this add to, add value or add uh, material to capital? How does this what does this do in terms of capitalism? How does this exist in terms of capitalism? What is it? Uh, how does it change production? And so, and what they, so what they're looking at and what they're seeing and what they're kind of revealing to us is the way that women's labour in the family, in fact, does impact on capitalism. So what they're suggesting is that women's caring labour in the home is actually essential to capitalism because of the way that this unpaid caring labour reproduces the male worker. Mm. So that's kind of that's kind of the beginning of the wages for housework uh, contribution. Yeah. And it, so it's it's saying it's it send you know it says w men go out to work and they do productive work. Then they come home and women have to reproduce them through. And this is what this is what housework means in the wages for housework uh, configuration. It's like well, it, it stretches beyond housework from the very beginning into things like things that we might not necessarily think of as housework, but are the un, anything that's unpaid in the home that's done by women. So like sex, caring for children, caring for elders, making meals, and as well as kind of more traditional forms of housework, like washing up all the laundry that's done, those kind of things. So all of those things, um, as particularly emotional labor, which gets picked up like a, a lot in um in society like you know it's picked up loads in feminism right now what emotional labor is and what it isn't um and that's a kind of way that wages for house that ideas of wages for housework continue so these so yeah so what what these women are saying the wages for housework people feminists are saying is that this that this unpaid labor actually has, makes a big contribution to capitalism because it reproduces people enable, and enables them to work. And for women who are doing the double day, which was many women from, from you know, many women particularly and um, very much particularly working class women, black working class women particularly were doing the double day, they were saying, wages for housework collective are saying, yep, they are doing the double day, then they're coming home. So they're, they're working in wherever they're working, in their workplaces, in their factories, in schools, as cleaners, and then they're coming back and they're doing reproductive work. So, yeah, so that's what yeah. they say. Yeah. I mean, I think I think that uh, distinction about productive and unproductive work, although we use production in a different way, don't we, in everyday language, it's actually probably quite helpful from an economic standpoint because one of Marx's arguments in Capital is that productive work from a capitalist standpoint mm -hmm. is work that makes money, mm -hmm. right? So actually the fact that all of this labor is going on, mm -hmm. that is essential 
and mm. is essential to people's everyday lives and you know allows them to live um is not considered to be productive and not considered to be profitable is actually important isn't it to think about in the sense mm. that socially it's not thought about m as money generating labor um even though as you as you as you mentioned it produces the it produces the laborers who produce money exactly but also it's it's really interesting isn't it that because that idea that it's not money generating generating work also speaks to ideas about gender right because mm -hmm. it's like this work is considered to be is often considered to be what is uh it, it's considered to be an inherent expression of what it means to be a woman so you know it, it it it's kind of like the idea that women are somehow just inherently more nurturing and caring than men and that their unwaged labor in the home is an expression of that and it's um you know which leads to all a massive kind of uh which, which leads to a really a really deep experience of alienation in the home by many women you know mm -hmm. and you see lots of propaganda from the 1970s from the feminist movement in the 1970s of all these houses with this with all these individualized speech bubbles that all say help um, <laughs> which is really like you know a, that's a kind of uh, wages for housework in intervention as well but what and what it's what is so interesting about wages for housework is that it's one of the first kind of ideas around of, of feminism that, that's suggesting that actually there is an in, inherent womanliness, that there isn't something inherent to women that is nurturing, that this is in fact uh, the way that women are kept doing all of this unpaid work is by this idea that it comes from within and that it's supposed to be this joyful um, uh, experience and if you if it isn't joyful for you if you're having a tough time as we know care work is often very tough caring for children is both joyful and very tough caring for elders is both joyful and very tough that you know that's somehow uh a blight on how much of a woman you are on how much of a good woman you are yeah yeah and i, I sorry uh, i i think i think one of the interesting things as well is is about this discussion is is it exposes a long running, um, well, so it's something that's not as bad now, but I, I definitely think something that for a long time was a real blight on the trade union movement, which was how it viewed women in general, you know, and that's why having discussions like this is so essential mm -hmm. for, for trade union activists to be involved in is because for such a long time, the, the sort of Marxist ideology of the working man was something that really poisoned the trade union movement's view of women mm -hmm. you know that it was you know that the, the only focus for any sort of revolutionary change was strengthening the working man and that was that was the role of the trade union movement was to be to be the strong arm of the working man i think one of the things that's really that i find the most useful about wages for housework is its critique of of exactly that. So um, the idea that women were being encouraged into into like formal workplaces yeah. um, because it was because that was where you could that's where you could cause disruption. Mm. That's where you could whereas, you know, for women that was like, well, I'm alienated at home. Am I really do I really want to go into a factory and like and do the same thing there, knowing that you know, when I come home, I have to do this second shift. Mm. Um, I really, so one of my favourite essays from the Wages for Housework movement is called Counter Planning from the Kitchen. Um, and I just, I find myself going back to it, like again and again, I just find it so useful. But um, she says this, she says this really simple thing that I just, I find kind of quite key to this whole thing for me, which is, she says, beginning with ourselves as women, we know that the working day for capital does not necessarily produce a paycheck and does not begin and end at the factory mm. gates um you know she says you know for as soon as we raise our heads from the socks we mend and the meals we cook and look at the totality of our working day we see clearly that while this does not result in a wage for ourselves we produce the most precious product to appear on the capitalist market labor power mm. um and you know obviously this work was not being recognized as as work you know it was like well 
get out of the home and do some real work in a factory where you can join a union and you can go on strike and we can kind of you know build this movement but I mean I guess the context for this as well is um, a lot of the especially the Italian women who are involved with wages for housework were also involved in what was happening um, in like the you know like Italy's hot autumn so like in the factories um, and kind of like worker takeovers of factories Mm. and like a really like super militant and resurgent like left movement um, that was led by unions and then kind of supported by students um so i think it's interesting that this critique emerges at at that moment um i think yeah can i also just say that i think that one of the um amazing contributions of wages for housework is an understanding of why jobs that resemble housework or that that are waged but resemble housework so jobs that are involved in the reproduction of workers like sex work, childcare work, teaching, cleaning, waiting tables, being a flight, being a flight attendant, being a teaching assistant, being a nurse, etc. Uh, why these jobs are paid poorly and are not valued by our society, mm-hmm. and that and wages for housework is is suggesting that the reason that is is because these jobs resemble the free labour that is done by women in the home. And that is an amazing, great, that is a great theoretical contribution um, that is that is very clear and very um, really kind of illuminates <clears throat> the position of women under capitalism in that way. Yeah. Mm. And, and what I think, and I think that's why now in this sort of current context as well, how the fights for equal pay not just for the same job but for equalizing pay across you know so where you've got equal pay where actually you're trying to bring back that balance so you're not just saying it's equal pay every bin man needs to be paid the same you know it's it's that you know that that kind of approach just doesn't cut it actually what you've got to say is everyone who does that similar sort of job regardless of whether it's traditionally being a man or traditionally being a woman doing it should be paid the same and that's why i think you know if we're talking about the legacy of that kind of of that kind of approach guarantee that that will have had an impact on people who have then gone on and fought for that kind of change you know Mm. yeah so in australia mechanics and hairdressers wages are tied yeah so when a mechanic gets a pay rise hairdressers get a pay rise yeah. In because actually, and in terms of like danger at work, mechanics and housewives, oh, just edit that out. <laughs> mechanics and hairdressers have a similar rate of particularly of things like repetitive strain injury. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. And in terms of casualization, and in terms of them, they're often small business owners, though, those kind of things. So there's an award, or there was an award historically that tied the wages of hairdressers to mechanics so exactly as you're saying that's so interesting mm, very interesting so i wondered i wondered if we get in in that spirit if we could dig a little bit deeper into yeah. how this was um put forward as a demand or kind of organized around because um i think there's some well in in the reading that i've done i found some interesting maybe a, a diver maybe it's a divergent maybe it's not a diversion in terms of how people think about this perspective so there seems to be a track of organizing that basically says we need to realize wages for housework in in various forms whether it's through a state wage so mm. like the way like the state is literally paying um mm. for hours done at home mm-hmm. whether that takes a more reformist of uh, uh form so the idea that sort of child benefit or family benefit is the is a version of that Mm -hmm. that you get uh, benefits or payments for this from the state for doing that kind of unproductive uh work in quotation marks but then there's also people like uh i'm probably going to mispronounce her name sylvia federici i hope that's right yeah who argues that so it seems to me that she's basically saying actually what is this is is actually a perspective it's not an economic movement we don't want so she says way her 
article is wages against housework. So yeah. it seems to me she's kind of saying we don't really want wages for housework. What we want is quite fundamental and and like transform transformative. Yeah. So I wonder if yeah. you could talk a little bit about how movements are organized around these and whether there is any kind of contradiction there or whether there, it's just different expressions of the same idea. Yeah, I so I can talk a little bit about that. So, so yeah, exactly, as you say, because the idea of housework or social reproduction as they're kind of um, both used to mean a similar thing, which is all of the work that is needed to reproduce a worker, um, it, it becomes, once you start thinking about that, it becomes very difficult to pin it down, right? So it's like, well, sex is reproduction, but also my education is reproduction. Uh, you know, going for a run is reproduction. Like, is everything reproduction? And so it's like every, but, you know, everything's housework, everything's social reproduction, everything outside money work. And so, for, and for many people, of course, it's money work too. Um. But I actually think that that's not a mistake. Like I don't, I think that it's as exactly as you say, that it's like that this is a provocation and it's a, um, it's a, it's an illuminating theoretical provocation really. And it has, and it has massive radical potential, which because, because of course, like there are critic, there are critics, people who were critical of wages for housework at the time um, were like, but how much will it cost me if my wife bakes a cake? How much will it cost me to get that cake served? <laughs> it cost, is it teaspoon by teaspoon of the baby food? How much will it cost per teaspoon? Like, and it's just a bit like, yeah, like the, the point is that you can't cost this work because yeah. this is the work that makes us human. This is actually the work that can't be done away with. This is like the work that our world should be formed on because care work is you can down tools, right? Like you can stop, um, it, although you guys are both teachers, so you can't, but like and, and, and those of us who are involved in reproductive work, know that it's so difficult to down you, that it's impossible that society stops functioning if you down reproductive tools it's so difficult it's much it's much easier to down tools if you're in a productive obviously um in bunny ears here productive job but like and so but the, and that's actually the point of wages the point of wages for housework is that it is this impossible mm. and utopian demand mm. it's like it's it's like we don't, we don't, you know, wait. My wage for feeding my child is one million dollars per spoonful because if <laughs> that, my child will die. You know, that is how yeah. serious reproductive labor needs to be taken. That is how much we need to place it at the heart of everything we do. And that's got the kind of beautiful utopia of wages for housework. And what is so compelling about it is that it names a problem which is this is unpaid work, this is done by women, this is hugely gendered, and it also says, and this is the work that we all need to be doing, this is the work that our society as a, um, a kind of equal and dignified society needs to base, needs to be, it needs to be at the heart of that. Yeah. I mean, it's interesting, actually, that you that what you mentioned in terms of, uh, sort of those minor arguments about what is valuable, I think you also have that problem in the in the formal economy as well. That actually, it's it's impossible to make those judgments. Really, a capitalist make those judgments, don't they, about what is worthy of high payment? Yeah, no, you're and it's normally their right. own work. <laughs> um, right. Um, so yeah, it just reminds me of like a little spat that happens in the early workers' movement between collectivists and communists, and collectivists are saying everyone should get labour vouchers after the revolution. And, you know, we'll allocate labour vouchers according to how useful what you're doing is. Mm -hmm. And then they have, you know, hours and hours and days and weeks of arguments about what is useful. And mm -hmm. actually, I suppose the point is, and um, the communist perspective comes from the fact that 
most things are right in a human economy most things are vitally useful yeah. including a huge amount of socially reproductive work yeah. there's a lot of useless some stuff that goes on under mm -hmm. capitalism mm -hmm. um but actually if you get like a raw economy that is making sure that humans are living and surviving then it's actually really hard to value things against mm -hmm. each other it's all pretty essential yeah. um so yeah I, I think i agree with you there's there's definitely a communist horizon um, yeah. perspective oh i think have been some kind of interesting things that have come out of it so you know like even the Fawcett Society have this thing where you kind of put in the Fawcett Society being I guess like uh they have more of a liberal feminist horizon right yeah. where they're sort of like interested in like women in the workplace yeah uh women well like women in top women, women like in top, top jobs, jobs. These kind yeah. of things, but they have a they have a calculator on their website where you can put in, you know, the unpaid labor that you do, and that is calculated in terms of dollar value. So I'm guessing I haven't done it because what is an unpaid labor? But like the, I'm guessing that the unpaid labor that they're calculating is things like if you have children, your um, caring hours will be calculated at the rate of a child care worker, those kind of things. So these are like, these are quite interesting ways to try to um, uh, usefully kind of and materially use um, the ideas of wages for housework. But I think that they do sort of lose that kind of exciting horizon. And I think it's really important to remember that at this moment, and when when people who were organising in the Wages for Housework campaigns talk about this, they sort of think, say things like, we thought we could change the whole world, world, we felt like we were flying. Like this was the kind of, it was an, ex it was like, a, they, they talk about it as like an extremely exciting time where it seemed like that communist horizon was perhaps much more just around the corner, right? So it comes from that time, let's like not lose that, that, culture of feeling mm. i think you've, i think you sort of an answered this by what you've just said there but i did want to sort of pick your brain about what you thought of some of the more some of the more practical outcomes of the wages wages for housework movement you know because um in sort of our talks before one of the things that i found quite interesting was the idea that things like things like child benefit and stuff were mm -hmm. were were birthed out of um the uh the wages for housework movement what what's your thoughts on on the connection between them and and whether that's a, a positive or or whether you like you said that actually the focus should be more we should remain more uh uh i don't know holistic more like holistic, everything yeah. we need to change yeah. everything yeah yeah yeah, yeah. like is a ref do you think there's reforms possible within this movement or out of this movement yeah. I would say, I mean, for me, things like child benefit, like, especially now, like, we can see, like, the way that child benefit is used, like, punitively. Like, you mm. know, at this point, like, if you have, is it more than, is it your third child? You stop receiving mm. um, child benefits unless you control families, yeah. you have been raped. So, mm. the, you know, in things that in some ways have been, like, very important and the fact that, child benefit was always uh, paid to like directly to mothers was actually really important but you can see how because there are reforms they can be kind of they can be taken away they can be used they can be used punitively um i think though there have been there have been some interesting like practical um applications of wages for housework like outside of that kind of framework so more the kind of within kind of more radical movements, if we want to talk about some of the kind of the legacy of wages for housework in the last few, from the last few years. Mm. Um, I mean, there are a few things that come to mind, which are um, a couple of, a couple of things that have, that are directly to do with uh, reproductive justice. Mm. Um, so um, in 2016, like women in Poland, went on strike because the the Polish government was about to introduce 
legislation that would effectively mean that abortion was illegal in all, all circumstances. So the the law on abortion in Poland is is very restrictive anyway, and this would have basically made it impossible for anybody to get an a legal abortion. And so um, women in Poland went on strike from their paid labor, from unpaid labor, from you know work in the home where they could, which is and I mean that is something that's interesting and we should we should talk about a bit maybe but um it worked mm. like the polish government backed down the legislation mm. was pulled it wasn't passed although i think there've been attempts more recently to try and push it through again um and then like more recently and probably more something that more people are kind of knew about at the time was strike for repeal which was um irish feminists um demanding a referendum on the repeal of the 8th amendment which is the amendment in the Irish constitution which made um which made it which made equivalent like the life of um a woman and and a fetus basically which meant that abortion mm. was illegal in Ireland so again there was um a call for women to go on strike but they made a a point of saying that they wanted to be women to go on strike from like all of their work where possible so their paid work but also mm. again the you know the work they do in the home reproductive labor um and again obviously we know this was very successful they called the referendum the referendum was won um there's also been i think that probably the the sort of the feminist current which has the most like direct link to wages for housework is uh women's strike which mm um has kind of emerged over the last couple of years i think was it kind of after tr- trump it was that first international women's day after trump i think after the after he was elected um yeah that's right because i think there was there was a big women's march after trump was elected which in london was surprisingly big mm. i think people were very surprised by how big it was but there was and there was a, there's been a kind of feminist vibe yeah. You know, you would say there's definitely like, uh, it, I think it would be, would it be wrong to say that we are possibly living in a time of mass feminism? Yeah, I don't think that would be wrong at all. And I think that it's pushing in this more radical direction. Yeah. So it's pushing in yeah. a more wages for housework direction in some, in, in terms of like the kind of the grassroots movement is pushing in that direction rather than a more kind of liberal feminist direction yeah. Yeah. Um, like less less reformist and more it feels more like revolutionary more radical than that um and so i mean the women's strike has been it was big in the so i think it's kind of started in the us um we also um there was a women's strike group in london and in birmingham um and so last oh no this year mm. there was a women's strike called um here and it was also massive in spain so it's called for international women's day so it's the 8th of march mm. i believe it's being called again next year interestingly silvia federici is one of the people that was uh, supporting it um and again it's this like this you know go on strike from your paid labor but also the labor at home but I mean, that raised some really inter- interesting questions um, among feminists that um, I organised with and Rosa and I organised with together about um, you know, who who can go on who can go on strike from that kind of labour. What if you are? Um, what does that look like if you are um, two women raising a child together? Um, yeah. What does um, what does it mean? when we talk about a strike but we don't actually mean that you're striking from your paid work so what so one of the things was like well if you can't go on strike maybe you can wear red to work like Mm. it does that uh, are we like totally comfortable with kind of changing the idea of what a strike means Mm. so much like if we're not comfortable like why are we not comfortable with it I I'm kind of in two minds about it because I think um I think that that perspective this kind of you know striking from your paid labor and your second shift is is really interesting and has like real potential I think I feel less positive about things like symbolic actions take being taken in the workplace and being called a strike mm. Mm. Um, 
So I think there's kind of three different things there. I think they're striking from paid work and striking in the home. Feel good about those. Feel less good about maybe sim- like symbolic actions being held like under the banner of a strike. Mm. Yeah, and 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 that's and that's that's a problem that it, that repeats itself in, in many different ways in strike when you're trying to build for strike action regardless of where of of what that strike action is for or how you title it uh, but especially in socialized work like that you know mm. especially where you your work comes with some sort of care and responsibility yeah, huge people yeah. people just really don't want to do it whether that's mm. whether that's teachers whether that's care workers you know whether that's nurses doctors whoever you know that is something that that people have a real natural inclination to not do Um, and people come up with other ways and say oh I'm not going to do it but I'll put we'll all wear the same colored t-shirt and I totally agree with you Lydia you you can't if you start calling that strike action then you dilute the term strike action yeah that's a a protest yeah but protest by all means but it's not is not strike action strike action Mm -hmm. is very specifically withdrawing your labor you know and 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 I think there's strength in that term for that exact reason you know I think there's different ways of doing it there's tons of different ways of doing it you know there's goodwill strikes there's you know there's a million different methods that have been used by people throughout throughout the history of our struggle but yeah you can't you can't dilute that term so much so it is it's a you know it sounds like it's a, a really difficult discussion to have but one that happens naturally throughout that process of building for strike action whether it's whether it's part of this or just the normal the normal action of building for strike action right yeah i mean i think so one of these maybe this is a minority view in the syndicalist movement but <laughs> being because obviously so like the big thing is to advocate for the idea of like the general strike right where everyone goes out and then lo and behold the next morning socialism has happened that tends to be the operating theory correct I can't yeah. wait yeah. <laughs> <laughs> tomorrow. but I think I think practical experience and common sense dictates a lot of time that strikes are very bitty and actually strikes are often a point of weakness really aren't they mm-hmm. that when you go on strike you're going out on a limb you're often uh, sort of pushing yourself away from the things that reproduce your yeah. survival and I think that's as true of socially reproductive work as it is a productive mm. work like you're losing your wage or you're losing yeah. your ability to sustain your family or your child or whatever yeah. um so i guess that leads me towards a question actually in the sense that because i don't think striking for the the formal trade union movement is the way that necessarily it builds power it's way it's the way it kind of pulls a lever yeah against mm-hmm. capitalists and maybe gets things yeah. but really um the way that the labor movement gains power is through you know seizure of mm. um factory seizure of workplaces and production occupation and production sort oh. of taking taking Chris, things for ourselves you're gonna be telling me joe hill wasn't the greatest musician of all time <laughs> <laughs> so my, my question that leads me towards this question which is in terms of the women's the women's strike is that a lever like is it a lever where it's we're going to be disruptive and then as a result of being disruptive, we want specific changes, like, for example, the way it's been successfully used to overturn certain laws. Or is it seen as potentially a, a source of power in the sense of we could use this thing to then actually transform society? Yeah, I think mm. it's the second one. Yeah, I think it's the second one. And I think that that's the legacy of wages for housework, the utopian legacy of wages for housework in something like the women's strike. I think the question of invisibility is a big one in terms of, like, how do you make the labour that is allegedly invisibilised, like the, the kind of the kind of point of, of women's work in the home, free women, like labour that's done for free by women in the home, is that it's firstly, as we've said, um, apparently inherent to women's gender. That's the way it's thought through. That's the way it kind of... Uh, is made to happen and the second thing is that it's invisible so that you know it's invisibilized in the home so it's not considered to be work but also women are doing it often very in in quite alienated places 
So there was a question around the women's strike of how we would show that we were going on strike. And there were, there were kind of things about like, oh, because the thing about, of course, the thing about housework, sorry, sorry, comrades, I'm just laboring this point. But the thing about housework <laughs> is that you don't even fucking notice that it's done until it's not done. That's yeah. how visible it is. It's like the quiet, it's like when you have um, a classroom where all your students are working beautifully and it's that scene as like, a classroom where you've not you've done no labor to make that happen you know you've not made great pedagogy that's actually relevant to them you haven't done loads of um kind of human work with them to make relationships to make relationships with their family that's just totally invisibilized and the only snapshot is the clean kitchen or the children who are all engaged and working beautifully you know yeah. that's not so that that's the thing about housework is that and and reproduction is that it's it's not it's not seen as it's not visible until it's not done so how do you make that visible so there were questions around the women's strike of like taking photos of like big stacks of dirty dishes in our sinks and those kind of things to kind of make that work to visibilize that work but i think i just want to make a point about visibility which is to say that i don't think that actually women's work is always invisible mm -hmm. and actually i want to make a point about um, the, because I think that there is this kind of tension between, and I'm interested in, this is just kind of ideas that I'm thinking through. I haven't really completely come to con a conclusion yet, but I think there really is a big tension between like ideas of labor that's invisible in the home, but then the state being very interested in things like birth rates things yeah. like schooling and and it's particularly like in in a colonial context in the colonial state which is also like a part of the study that I do and stuff that I am very interested in that like actually the state had a lot to say about the reproduction of for example uh you know male male workers who went to who went to colonies colonies of britain or colonies of the netherlands particularly they had a lot to say about how those workers would be reproduced and they often had specific legislation around the use of black women's labor in the colonies and then how white women would then be used to kind of uh mediate relationships uh and as a kind of um, kind of like a policewoman of the frontier type scenario where the white woman would later come to the colonies. So this was kind of and and uh, mediate the relationships between black women and white men, which were often relationships of sex work, which were sometimes convivial relationships, uh, which were often relationships of abuse as well. So like this is kind of like core state business. So how mm. invisible really is women's labor in this situation? Yeah. In fact, yeah. very invisible I mean, at all. Yeah. I, that kind of, but on a formal level, that kind of makes sense, right? Because, uh, well, Marx's argument is the state plays the role of the general capitalist, right? It, it, so because capitalists individually don't know what's good for them. So the state plays the role of this is what is good for capitalism as a whole. So in a way, that is an admission, isn't it? That, mm. that the unproductive sphere um is or the socially productive sphere yeah it's really important is really important to the maintenance of capitalist society and it does need legislation it does need control and it does need regulation from the standpoint of capitalism as a whole it's yeah. just it is it within the interests of men and capitalists individually to basically not regard it as work mm. yeah yeah definitely there's a difference between like not seeing this work and not recognizing it as work and I think right. that's like that's maybe the right like the the kind of what underlies this is that like this is work that we this is work that we see, but it isn't recognized. It isn't recognized as work. Yeah. Unless it's unless it's expedient mm. to do so. I mean, I think one of the things that came up with the women's strike stuff in in London was and generally I think in the UK was that the there was an idea that the women's strike was basically impossible that for various reasons that particularly striking from um like striking from social reproduction so you know socially reproductive work was actually impossible like for people you know children 
<laughs> children need to eat you know they need to be like they need to get to school all of these things um and so yeah I mean in that respect it was kind of like the fact that it wasn't possible to do it's an inter it's like a, a kind of a, an interesting contradiction the idea that because it's not possible for women really to like to strike from this like fully and the you know different kinds of women women with like fewer resources more marginalized women in particular can't mm. strike um and that you know demonstrating yeah that, i mean just that demonstrating like how crucial this work is that it can't be put down was also part of it. It was kind of, there's a funny mm. contradiction in it. It's like, mm. we're not going to do it so that you can see that it's not being done, but also we can't not do it. Mm. There was kind of both of those things going on, which was like an interesting tension, I thought. That I've I, I've thought about a lot since mm. last year. And I think, I mean, def in, it's gearing up in London for like, for organising for, for, for uh, the 8th of March again in 2019. Mm. So... I'm looking forward to like thinking about that a bit more. Mm. Are there are there collective resources and solutions that you envisage that would help make the strike more accessible or would be a basis of building forms of social power? I mean, a big component of the women's strike was these like social reproduction teams, which were men. So um, mm. at the meetings, like the planning meetings, um, the childcare, and the and the food everything else was done by men and the idea was and it I mean it was it was great like on the day in London um there was a rally and um lots of uh lots of guys had kind of got together and had cooked like huge vats of you know delicious you know food. the kind of uh you know the kind of food <laughs> <laughs> we've all we've all uh, had it, it was from the vegan mush it, it was, was a vegan was slop yeah. <laughs> no, it was good one it of was... the various colors of vegan slop <laughs> um, it was delicious food and was it the brown one or the orange one <laughs> it was black oh. actually oh. it was black beans oh okay oh right oh, i remember yeah, excited. Really, really impressive it was really delicious but also the women's strike it should be said was actually um, also, I think the women's strike was very, I, I would say it was very successful. Yeah. I think there was great coalition building between women. It wasn't successful in the sense that we stopped capitalism <laughs> through downing the tools of social reproduction. Yeah. That did not happen. But what did happen was that there were, like, amazing alliances built across uh, different groups in of women in London, including Kurdish women, including Iranian women, including like a whole range of, of different women, um, you know, feminist fight back were involved, sisters uncut were involved, kind of like core feminist organising collectives were involved in the women's strike, that people bought into it. And it also was luckily happened that it was timed so that um, it, it coincided with the UCU striking. Yes. So the university lecturers... Yeah. Uh, and people who work in universities were on strike at that time. So mm -hmm. that was, you know, and that is a reproductive labour force. They reproduce workers too. So mm -hmm. they were, you know, it was great to see comrades there and it made it like a really interesting cross-section mm -hmm. of people, yeah, both paid and unpaid reproductive work. Yeah. yeah. And I guess that, that, that sort of follows on quite naturally to the next point we wanted to talk about anyway, which is, which is how how this connects to the wider trade union movement, you know, how how this embeds in that, what lessons there are for the for the wider trade union movement. Um, you know, I think uh, how how we as trade union activists can apply the the ideas but also how we can build that into our organising. How can we build our organising around an idea that, that that goes outside of just a capitalist understanding of what productive labour is? Um, and, and how do we build on top of that, I guess? Mm. Yeah, I mean, I think that um, if we think back to our very first podcast episode, <laughs> 
Um, <laughs> yeah, taking you back there with our word. Um, and we talked. We talked about. Um, we talked about. Well, it was. It was about organising versus mobilising. Check it out. It's excellent. But we talked about um, Jane McAlevey, and um, mm. she has this interesting concept of um, whole worker organising. Um, so instead of just thinking of about kind of how you can build power in workplaces, thinking about how you can how you can build power in communities which then kind of which feeds back into the workplace and back out into the community and kind of create this um just kind of you know building power in like every aspect of of people's lives um i think that that actually owes quite a lot to this wages for housework perspective that you know acknowledging that you know especially women workers go home from like the ready meal factory or whatever and make a and meal make and make a meal for their kids mm. and that also these these people will have um issues with um housing with so with their landlords with like uh their um status as migrants um health care yeah exactly like all of the all of the ways they reproduce themselves basically mm. um i think like an interesting example of this um is What's it is West London. We had that. Um, we did an interview with um, Anne um, at conference, who talked about the solidarity networks that they formed in West London and how, um, you know, supporting people that they meet through work um, with their issues around immigration and with housing, things like that, has mm. um, you know built like really strong relationships, has built trust. Um, and that you know plugging away at that would ultimately build power you have like people who are more confident that they can you know fight back at work but also they can fight back against their landlord they can fight back against the home office and that you know all all of these things kind of build like build power and and confidence uh which we need in our in our movement so i just thought that was like a quite mm. quite an interesting like concrete example of of that whole worker organizing which i think is quite linked quite tied to what we've been talking about yeah and i, and I, I think i really i really loved when we were preparing for this reading reading, reading angela davis's perspective mm-hmm. on this i think she was you know i think her ideas are really great around this you know the, the kind of idea that you know funnily enough as you said the sort of working in the fast food industry you know she talked about mcdonald's and kfc and you know that that's more meals cooked away from home and actually is also more women working as well you know and 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 actually then talking about these idea of new social institutions i think is really good as well because it's actually talking about building those kind of ideas of building collective approaches to to solve some of this stuff you know and i think and I think that is something that as radicals we get we have a role in, isn't it? You know, like you're sort of talking about dealing with issues of dealing with issues of housing. Well, what do we do with that? We organise around it. We build power in that. We build power to face that down. Yeah. And it's sort of building those. But through this approach of looking at wages for housework, we start to build different positions of power and different bases of confidence, as you said. I think. Mm. There are, yeah, I think that these are real. This is really true, and it's really great to think about the, the practical implications of wages for housework. I've just been thinking about how it is organising in a school, which is the trade union organising I've also done, and the way that we're all very divided up in terms of our uh, trade union affiliations, even though we're all. Um, even though all of us who work in a school from cleaners through to dinner staff through to teaching assistants through to teachers are all involved in the re- in reproduction of children and uh, enabling adults to work for a wage so we're, we're really involved in reproducing the family in reproducing knowledge and reproducing workers so we're all involved in that and I just wonder what it would mean to make you know, to have a committee where you talk to 
all of the other people in your school who were also involved in reproduction. So you would have a representative who was a cleaner, a representative who was a teaching assistant, a representative who was a teacher, and a representative who was uh, a dinner supervisor. That would be a really good way to organise across reproduction, and I think, mm. and, and across uh, reproductive capacity, because I think it is so much more difficult, in my experience, uh, to strike as somebody who literally does the core business of the school. So the people who do the core, core business of the school, the, the, the school actually closes if they don't do their, bus their, their work is, of course, dinner supervisors. If there's no food, the school closes. And cleaners. If there's dirty tables, dirty floors, kids can't learn and the school shuts down. So they're the people who are actually often in the most squeezed, least confident position, but they're the ones who have the power. And teachers teachers can learn from them in terms of we shut we just shut the school down. We can just shut the school down. You know, they have a particular capacity to do that. That's very powerful. What you're talking about is really interesting because that is obviously fits into the traditional industrial unionist approach, right? That you don't you don't just you don't just organise one around one trade. You organise around an industry, yeah. and actually, maybe it's a wider concept of what we're talking about when we're talking about industry because we're not just talking about education. We're talking about practically we're talking about the industry of reproduction. We're talking about the industry of capitalist reproduction, aren't we? You know, mm -hmm. so actually. The industrial unionist approach fits really well into that. Yes. Um, and interestingly, you know, that that's the direction that the NEU in this country has taken now is 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 to build yeah. a union for the whole of education. That's great. Yeah. Also, I think, and this is um, from Sylvia Federici's work, um, where, where I think that there's a really big implication, particularly around in terms of talking about things like education, because as you were saying, there is this really big pressure on teachers and people who work in education not to strike yep. because of the way that care is placed at the heart of what they do. Yeah. So care is like, care is our core business. You know, we, we didn't go into teaching because we wanted to make money. We went into teaching because we really give a shit and we can see yep. the radical potential for education. Yeah, so what she what she says is like that that people that that parents are the ones and service users, including students, if you, for example, work in FE or the university, are the ones who can take the pressure off. They're yeah. the ones who can say, I fucking support my students' teachers going out. Yeah. Because they I know that by getting better wages for them, by getting better conditions for them, my children will get a better you know, they will get cared for better. The caring that is done by in, in a school will be able to be better because people will have a little bit more time and a little bit more money. So that's like one of the really good ways, I think, that Wages for Housework can talk to, as you say, like a complete cross-industry thing. Mm. But also I think Wages for Housework, you know, when you're in the drudge of like a union or when you're in the drudge of trying to get um, – people in your workplace to strike or you're in the in the in the kind of difficulties of how hard it is to organize you know around one members uh around one unionist issue or one comrades issue at work and how you're in a difficult you know kind of moment in a bargaining case or yeah. in a whatever you kind of mo difficult moment you're in wages for housework can really sort of offer you a vision of what it actually means to struggle of what we're actually aiming for, that it's not just about this person's equal pay case or this person's maternity leave or this child's, you know, fulfilling this child's special educational needs or whatever, you know, whatever it is, it's it's about a whole vision for society where care is really placed at the heart of it. Mm. So Wages for Housework really reminds us as, as that, for, mm. of that as trade unionists. Yeah. You know, that's nice. Yeah. Definitely. Yeah. And and I think I think it, the phrase that you used earlier that I really I really like and I'll take away from this, I think, is is the idea of like a utopian legacy. I think that's really yeah. great. You know, that concept that the it's it, a struggle which seems extremely practically focused on the front is actually in reality extremely utopian. And it's it, I, and it carries that legacy on with it, I think. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. 
Great. Well, it's been a real pleasure talking to you. Um, and I really appreciate your contribution today. Um, Thank you so much for yeah. having me. It was yeah, so it's been great. really great. It's it's been a really interesting conversation. Yeah. Um, so, as you will all know, we've been running the Too Many Men series, which is now coming to an end. Um, and in February, we will be starting a new series on populism and we'll be looking for contributors towards that so if you've got any ideas for articles uh please do let us know uh, or if you've got an idea for a catchy title for the series that would also be really helpful <laughs> we're struggling we may run a competition <laughs> um uh, thank you for listening for, to talking shop today um we uh, we normally do a close at this point, but I think we've decided we've run that particular gambit to its end. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm saying that because I'm doing the close, so I, I don't want to do it anymore. Um, thank you for listening to Talking Shop, and don't forget to subscribe. Thanks. Thank Bye. you. Cheers. Thank you for listening to Talking Shop, a podcast by New Syndicalist for trade union activists and organisers. If you'd like to listen to previous episodes or review our other content, please check out our website, newsyndicalist.org. You can also keep updated on future episodes by subscribing to our podcast via Acast, iTunes or Stitcher. While you're there, why not leave us a review to help us find more people like yourself? If you have a suggestion for future content, would like to submit your own ideas, or would like to discuss any of the ideas raised in this or previous episodes, please contact us at newsyndicalist at gmail.com. Thanks again. Bye.